<clears throat> so in this case, I did ask you to draw all possible mechanisms and products. There's a little note at the bottom that I needed to show the wrong one, because in theory, you would have drawn the correct one. <clears throat> so if we go through and look at our very first step, the alkene donates its electrons to a hydrogen. So that hydrogen now needs to be, have <coughs> electrons shared between it and a carbon. The question becomes, which carbon? Right? The more substituted or the less substituted? In this case, I went through and said, well, more substituted is nice. Let's put the hydrogen there. Right? If I do that, the other carbon has now lost electrons. So if we kind of walk through this real quickly, what we're doing in this case is we're moving those pi electrons. I am taking them away from my carbon structure. Okay? And I'm now placing them back into the structure in such a way that the electrons are being shared between the hydrogen and a carbon. Which carbon am I deciding to share them with? Well, in this case, that more substituted position, right? Okay. So what happened to that carbon? Well, step one, what did I do? I took electrons away. Step two, what did I do? I gave the electrons back. Okay. So what happened to the charge on that carbon? Nothing. Nothing. Lost electrons, gained electrons. Okay. What happened to the other carbon? I ripped the electrons away. And I gave them to another carbon. So those electrons were ripped away, leaving that as a positive charge. Positive charge not stable. Chloride comes in. We could end with that potential product. At this stage, we're ignoring rearrangements, um, really just for simplicity's sake for this question. Okay. And so what we've gone through and done is drawn the wrong product. Okay. This is the incorrect mechanism. It is better to have the hydrogen go to the other position. Because if we went to the hydrogen to the other position, what would happen? I would form a more substituted carbocation. The chloride could then come in and share there. Okay. So there's two potential paths that this thing could go through and do. The blue one is ultimately a better path, okay? though admittedly now without curved arrows. Okay. But I want you to at least think about these things. Okay, the next part behind this would be drawing an energy diagram, excuse me, for each of those mechanisms. Okay, so just like our SN1s, this is two steps. We would look at how it breaks down all the way through. Okay, so we'll do a tiny one in the corner here. Energy, there's our reactant. If we follow the black path, I'm forming a carbocation, higher or lower in energy. That should be higher in energy, why? It's charged, so I'll draw the intermediate for that one. Then I form my product. Higher or lower in energy than my intermediate? Lower because? Not charged. Higher or lower in energy than my starting material? Lower in energy because? No pi bond. Okay. So we could end up with, doo -doo -doo, yeah. for our black path, something that looks roughly like this. Sorry, right, got a little shifty at the end. All right, what happens with the blue path? All right, well, I'm still starting at the same reactant. I'm now going to form a carbocation. That carbocation will still be higher in energy than my reactant. But where will it be in comparison to the other intermediate? It should be lower because I'm looking at a tertiary carbocation versus a secondary. So I would expect that to drop a little bit lower. Where should the product be? Okay. It should be lower than both blue points, but now, of course, we've got an added complexity. Should it be as low as the black one? Why not? Why is this blue product not as stable as the black product? Because David's louder. Let's see if he says the same thing. But yes, you're right. Uh, <laughs> if we go through and look at that difference, it's just the location of where the chloride is. Okay? In the black case, it's chloride next to hydrogen. In the blue case, it's chloride next to carbon, that methyl group. Well, what's the difference between the methyl and the hydrogen? Methyl's, methyl is bigger because it has more electrons. So in the blue structure, I'm putting more electrons in the exact same space, which would mean 
higher in energy. So we would see a slight spike in that energy level. Right? We can now go through and look at our reaction, our energy diagram. Okay? Based off of this analysis, which product do you think we should get, black or blue? Okay, why do you say black? I don't know. Um, I just thought the, the product of the black is lower in energy. When you go through and run a reaction, what kind of product do you want? You want the most stable. Which product is the most stable? Black. The black one. So shouldn't the black one be the product? For the first no. Why is the black one not the product? To get to the product, what must happen? You have to move through all of this stuff. You have to move through that intermediate. What's dictating whether we can make it through that section? Activation energy, and in particular, of which step? The first step, because that's the highest energy. When we take a look at, whoops, I thought that was a black pen. We take a look at the activation energy for the black reaction versus the blue reaction. The blue reaction activation energy is significantly lower. What does that mean? I can form that product faster, that intermediate faster. If I form that intermediate, then what happens? It continues out to the product. Okay? So I end up only seeing the blue part product. Okay? There are cases where we can tweak effectively the energetics of the reaction to force the black one to happen. Okay? That's why we get anti-Markovnikov type systems, or legitimately anti-Markovnikov type systems. Okay? And that has to do with the balance of all of those reactions. Okay? In our description, we talked about blue versus black. We said black should have formed because it is lower in energy. Since we're talking about energy, we could reference that as begins with a T. Thermodynamic. When we talked about the blue being the product, we talked about that one because it formed faster. So now we're not talking about energy, we're talking about speed. That would be referencing kinetics. This is when we first introduce the concept of kinetic versus thermodynamic. Okay. In certain circumstances, it becomes a really big issue. First semester pretty much doesn't show up at all, and we just go through and we can say Markovnikov and be done with it. Okay. This is the first case where it really starts to appear, and we can see it in our energy diagrams if we choose to look at it. If we don't choose to look at it, then we're just memorizing the end results out. Okay which is why second semester becomes so much harder because virtually every reaction in second semester is dependent on kinetics and thermodynamics. Okay? So a huge section of second semester is saying, well, what's the kinetic product? What's the thermodynamic product? What are the conditions that are going to force one over the other? Okay? Most of those conditions come out of looking at your energy diagram and being able to interpret that. When did you learn about kinetics and thermodynamics? In 152, 151 doesn't address it enough to be able to deal anything with. Okay? So second semester OCHEM is really just a replay of second semester general chemistry, but now applied. All those calculations you ran in 152, don't stress about. Those aren't coming back in second <laughs> semester gen chem. We're not doing that. Okay? But what we end up doing is saying, well, what are the conditions that would force one or the other? Okay. We don't have to quantify what that difference is. We just say, well, it's going to be forced one way or another. And that's about it. Yes? If kinetics and thermodynamics get most light, who wins? Depends on the conditions of the reaction. So if it's hot, thermodynamics okay. probably wins. What happens if I heat up the reaction? Okay. All reactions go faster. If I heat up the reaction, what happens? I get enough energy that I can clear both of these reactions. With enough energy, I'm still going to go over the smaller one. I'm still going to form the kinetic product. Okay. But you also form the thermodynamic product as well. But if I heat it up almost exclusively at the end of the result, I get only the thermodynamic. What the? How did that happen? 
by heating it up, what have I provided energy for? Not to necessarily clear this activation barrier, but to clear the other activation what other activation barrier? At high temperatures, I've provided enough energy to clear that activation barrier, which means the kinetic reaction runs in equilibrium, reverses back to the reactant. Some small percentage goes through into the thermodynamic. I haven't provided enough energy for the thermodynamic product to reverse. If the thermodynamic can't reverse, it's not in equilibrium. I constantly siphon product into the thermodynamic product. What happens if I drop the temperature then? You might not get anything. If I don't have any heat, can I reverse that reaction? So which product do I get? The kinetic. Okay? I barely have enough energy to clear activation barriers. There's no way in hell I'm going to clear the thermodynamic activation barrier, but what I can clear is the kinetic. Once I've made it over to the kinetic product, because it is lower in energy than everything, that activation barrier is now so large, I can't reverse it. At low temperatures, no equilibrium. I get the kinetic product. All right? So it's all a question of looking at how temperature and sometimes reaction conditions can force these reactions. And ultimately, it all ties back to equilibrium. All right? It is a challenging concept to manipulate and deal with. This is why a lot of students just memorize the end result. Okay? For these conditions, this is what I get. Okay? And usually what we end up getting is, well, what if I had a blend of those conditions? Is... <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Welcome to OCAM. <laughs> what happens if I get a blend of those conditions? I would get a mixture of both products. Why would we choose to ignore that in organic chemistry? Because that's, that's not a useful system to go through and do. Right? If you wanted to study kinetics and thermodynamics in OCHEM, phenomenal. You can dig into that. But for what we're trying to cover within the class, what we're trying to do is how do I make something? I make something because I get one product, not a giant cluster bomb of all sorts of products. Right? So we tend to avoid looking at those conditions that we get blends of products. Okay? So this is our kinetic thermodynamic argument. It does appear relatively minor role. Wanted to see you at least show you where it's coming from and foreshadow second semester a bit. Ultimately, what you need to remember is that when we go through and run our reaction for an electrophilic addition, okay? by the way, for the record, this mechanism in the energy diagram I'm attempting to build here, we're supposed to match that question that you just worked on, right? Do they match? Yeah. Yeah? I mean, like, Are you sure? Forgot the second one. No. What were you asked to draw? Cyclo what? Hex. What did I draw? Pentine. Pentine. Okay. Somebody can't, can't count higher than five, apparently. <laughs> Simple mistakes. They can add up, so make sure you answer the question that's asked. Okay? Or answer the question that you want people to, or ask the question that you want people to answer, right? Okay? So, but what we end up doing, same general idea and how those things all stack out. We can see, again, that kinetic versus thermodynamic issue popping up within our energy diagram. We can make it look pretty and do all this. Ultimately, what comes out of this is that Markovnikov went through and said that the red product formed the most often. Why? Well, it's ultimately that balance of kinetics and thermodynamics. Okay? In that balance of kinetics and thermodynamics, the thermodynamic argument wasn't necessary okay? or wasn't an important factor. Okay? And we end up seeing the intermediate drive the reaction. So it's the stability of that intermediate. So when we're looking at electrophilic addition reactions, make your most stable intermediate. Okay? That gets called Markovnikov addition if it follows that condition. Okay? Even then, what gets called Markovnikov addition isn't forming the most stable intermediate. It's saying the hydrogen went to the position that had the most hydrogen. That's what Markovnikov means. 
right? So it has nothing to do with stability. It has nothing to do with how reactions work. It's just hydrogen goes there, okay, regardless of the source of the hydrogen. Yes? If we see something like that and then it has some specific condition, does it make us think that... <clears throat> so specific condition, so I'm going to kind of interrupt you right there because I can already tell you will see some specific condition that could direct us... That won't happen this semester. Okay. Second semester, yes. Up to yin yang. Worry about it then. Okay. So, when we're going through and dealing with our mechanisms, we want the most stable carbocation. Okay. That's the point that we're trying to push for. Okay. So, predict away. Tell me what your products would be. Okay. Draw them out. If you've got questions, raise your hand. But get some of those products. If we start evaluating that bottom one and we look through and evaluate these, these pi bonds are all part of a benzene, which means they're all involved completely and entirely in resonance, making all of those pi bonds not alkenes, which means not reactive as far as we're concerned. Okay? So we do have that external pi bond. That external pi bond can react with the hydrogen. Okay, the result being that we would, excuse me, place our positive charge either here or here. Which of those two positions would be the more likely place to form the positive charge, red or blue? Red. Why the red only? That is a resonance-stabilized carbocation. Okay. Both of those positions are secondary, but that red one is by far more resonance stabilized, which means our hydrogen is going to go to the blue position. We don't form a carbocation there. The end result is that I place the chlorine here. Nobody asked about the question above. Isn't that only one product? No. That's two. That's Why is this only more than one product? That is a chiral carbon, okay? which means as it's drawn is incorrect. We would need to specify that extra information. When we go through and acknowledge how that last bond formed, the chlorine attacked a carbocation. The carbocation has, elect or has empty p orbital above and below, which means the chlorine could come in and be wedged or, and rather and, I should say, the chlorine needs to be, did I get six in there? Yeah. yeah. The chlorine needs to be dashed, so I get two products. The same thing's happening with the question above it. Hi? Make sense? Yes? For a test, if it asks for all products, can you just write, well, it's the ACS So we've got a little bit of a difference coming up. You guys may be going, oh, what kind of weird show your work type questions might get asked? I'm not going to ask any. Okay? It's the ACS. The ACS is all multiple choice. Okay? You could get a question, how many products are produced in this? One, two, three, four, five. Uh, you wouldn't have that many. One, two, three, four, because it's just A, B, C, D. Okay? So you would have to be able to look at it and to acknowledge that you've generated two different structures. Right? The ACS could get a bit nasty on you because they could give you this reaction here and say, which, how many products? And you'd say, well, two. They might also give you the very first question. And you'd be like, oh, because it can attack from the top and the bottom, it must give me two. Is that a chiral compound? No. So the first one only gets one product, not because we don't form a carbocation. We do. And not because the bromine can't attack from both sides of that positive charge. It can. But whether that bromine is wedged or dashed is really irrelevant because it's not chiral. I don't have to worry about it. Okay? So you always have the potential of two products. The question becomes, are those two products identical? If they're identical, you only have one thing. Okay? If they're an antimers, that's two things. Make sense? Okay. Upper right. Yeah? Why five products?
Product number one. Product number two. Yeah. That's what happens, because I have to zoom in on my screen. So just erase all of that. Product number three. Product number four. Product number five. Why with product number five did I stop showing wedges and dashes? Because it's no longer a chiral center. That is not a chiral carbon anymore. I don't have to specify wedges and dashes. So there's all five possible products. Right out of the gate, that pi bond, both those carbons have the same number of hydrogens. If you wanted to evaluate it that way, they would produce the same stability carbocation, secondary. Right? Which means both of those positions are equally likely to pick up a hydrogen, which is why we get our first set of two products. Then the chloride could theoretically come in and attack. Okay? Our really pioneering student might notice that we're forming a carbocation, and we think carbocations, we need to think rearrangements. Was there a potential for a rearrangement? I could move from the secondary to a tertiary position through a hydride shift, and I'd end up placing the carbocation at that tertiary position. Now the chloride can come in. I'm not asking you to tell me what the percentage of each of these products are. Right? All I want you to be able to do is to recognize that all of those are potential products. Would that be a good reaction to run? Probably not. No. Okay, that would be a horrible reaction to run. We get way too many products. Okay? Make sense? Last one. We get two potential answers in here. Okay? Officially, it's zero products. We don't get anything. Why not? Okay. An alkene is a weak nucleophile. That pi bond only reacts because we're reacting it with a strong acid or a strong electrophile. Water is not a strong acid or a strong electrophile. So that reaction would not progress. How could we very quickly have changed this to allow it to progress? That's why there was a box there. I would need to add a strong acid. So we could have written H3O plus, okay? Which is kind of a cop-out answer, but that's fine, okay? H3O plus is our strong acid. The H plus can react. We now have a positive charge. What do I use to neutralize that positive? I need electrons. Where are the only electrons in this reaction? On the oxygen from water. The electrons come in and attack. That was pretty ugly. It's not getting any prettier. Does oxygen want to be positive? No, what happens? I can deprotonate, and I would end with the final answer with the OH connected. Do I need to worry about two products? No. No, I do have that carbocation, but it doesn't matter where the water attacks because it's not a chiral product or not a chiral center. Okay? So I don't have to specify wedges and dashes. Okay? Believe it or not, that's pretty much chapter 11. And the rest of it is just kind of going through and looking at more details and kind of practice behind each of those pieces. Right? The big thing to distinguish is that water is a nucleophile, okay? but it's not an electrophile or strong enough of an, an acid to react with the alkene. So we have to catalyze this reaction by adding a strong acid. Okay? H3O plus, I said, was kind of a cop-out because we can't just go into the store and buy H3O plus. Okay? We could buy water and add an acid to it. What acid do we add? A strong acid. So HCl. What's the problem with HCl? The chloride is a nucleophile. 
So we could be adding the chloride to our alkene. Do I want the chloride added? No, in this case, I was aiming for the alcohol as a final product. So what acid can I add that does not also provide a nucleophile? Those of you in lab don't have an excuse. Well, you do. You just didn't listen to me. That's okay. <laughs> H plus is too vague. That's the same thing as H3O plus. Sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid. H2SO4. The sulfate anion is not nucleophilic. The nitrate anion, not nucleophilic. So they would supply the necessary catalytic hydrogen to initiate the reaction. Uh, and then the sulfate or nitrate would not act as a nucleophile. We'd be left with water acting as our nucleophile to go through and complete. Make sense? Questions about any of that? Okay, cool. So, stereochemical traps. We've already addressed some of these. We've got that pi bond. Each of our reactions can generate potential stereochemical issues. Okay? Sometimes this shows up, sometimes it doesn't. We just addressed some of it. Okay? And in fact, when I went through and drew this, you'll notice that I actually ignored one of the stereochemical traps. If we go through and react this with, say, our H+, what happens? The pi bond reacts, placing the H plus on the structure, right? Leaving us with a carbocation. Yeah? Everybody agree? I'm going to assume that was a yes, very soft one. That's cool. The bromide or our nucleophile could come in from the top or from the bottom, generating two potential products. Is that the only potential products I could have gotten out of this? Why no? The uh, Yes, but like the carbocation, but we'll argue that there's symmetry and that's not going to be an issue. The sigma bond rotating isn't going to be an issue because it's effectively the bromide now just attacking from the other side. Okay. What's the assumption that we're evaluating to only get... Why did the second... Oh, I just didn't draw it. <laughs> Why is the second one not there? Hey, because dipstick, you didn't draw it. Where's the other stereochemical trap that we potentially have to watch out for? No. That's not a chiral carbon. We can, uh, you're, like you're changing the question. So if, if you want to have that problem, we can fix that problem very okay. quickly. No, I was, I was wondering if that was what the track you were talking about was. No. Instead, it's not actually. No, it has nothing to do with it. Okay. Where's the other issue? What reacted with the hydrogen? Pi bond. A pi bond. Where's the pi bond? Where are the pi electrons? With the hydrogen. Oh. oh. Where are the pi electrons? Are they still in the p orbitals? They're in the p orbitals. And where are the p orbitals? Still in the Above. And below. I've only drawn half of the possible reactions. Where's the other half? I could have had the bottom react. Okay, forming my carbocation and then getting the same split out all the way out in the end. Everybody see that? Right? We get a split to our final products because we have a carbocation. We're used to seeing carbocations get generating two products because I can put electrons from top or bottom. The pi bond is effectively the same thing. You're reacting the same thing. It's p orbitals. Those p orbitals have electrons both above and below the plane of the molecule, which means I could have the electrons swing out of the structure both above and below. Those two structures are now different from each other. 
And because of that, I can get more products. This does tend to be an exceptionally rare issue. Okay? Why might we see this section in the middle here, looking at the red versus the purple, being a rare problem? This makes one really big assumption. That position must be chiral for this to be a problem, which means there has to be four different things there. Typically, when we react out our alkene, is it fully substituted? No, there's almost always a hydrogen there, which then means not chiral. There's no difference between those two products, and I don't worry about it. Right? It can be a potential problem. Cardi's got a fantastic picture, I think, in the next two slides that we'll look at. Okay? So we have to be aware of that initial investment of those electrons from your pi system. They can come out and react above the structure and below the structure. There is a potential to generate two potential intermediates. Yes? Would we have equal amounts of the ball? And you would have equal amounts because the electrons are evenly distributed both above and below. Okay? So it is a rare circumstance because typically when you react with that hydrogen, there was already a hydrogen there. That invalidates that position being chiral. Because it's not chiral, there's no difference between the purple and the red. In this case, I haven't said what one and two are. They're very clearly not hydrogen because it says one and two. Right? So now we have that potential problem showing up. It is a rare question to ask, but it can get asked. Okay? So when we're looking at our alkenes, alkenes are achiral starting materials. This means that our products must also come out to be achiral. Okay? That doesn't mean I only get one product and it is achiral. That means I get two products and they have to be in antimers of each other to cancel out. Okay? Or it could be in antimers of each other to cancel out. Right? So, <clears throat> it may or may not surface as a problem. If you see wedges and dashes, or you see a Hayworth projection from your starting alkene, it is a problem that they're explicitly going to ask you that. Okay? That extra information has to get layered in, otherwise you don't have a way to interpret. Does that make sense? Okay? So use your structures as a hint to help you go through and be like, oh crap, I'm going to have to worry about this. Okay. So that just reveals those out, showing that issue. Here's the textbook's awesome figure behind it. No, we're starting with a Hayworth projection. We're taking a cyclohexene, and instead of looking at it nice and flat, we took it and turned it on edge, aiming out of the paper at us. That allows us to help us see the up-down relationship. That's where Hayworths really show their strength. Okay. The pi bond can react with the deuterium either above or below the plane. Because there's no other deuteriums on that structure, we have, effect, we have a chiral atom at that position, which means those two products or intermediates are an antimers. Being an antimers, now the bromide can come in and attack from the top or bottom of the carbocation, generating two possible products all the way out. You're going to get equal amounts all the way through that. Okay, so it's going to be a giant mess of products. Okay, so alkene additions can be very complicated. Don't just say, oh, it's easy, and just throw a hydrogen on and throw your nucleophile on. Look at that starting information. If they're giving you a hint by showing you a Hayworth, or they're showing you uh, wedges and dashes, either in the starting material or in your answer choices, that's a giant red flag that you need to be very careful about thinking about the mechanistic step behind how it worked. Yes? That's only because they're using deuterium, right? That this yes, is which is exactly what I said on the, the previous slide. When we added the hydrogen, the only reason it became a problem is that that was a chiral atom. The only reason it's chiral is because one and two weren't hydrogens. They're adding deuterium here. Why are they adding deuterium here? Because they didn't want to pick a tertiary substituted or tetra substituted alkene because it looks like a giant freaking mess. Oh, okay. So they, instead of using HBr, used deuterium because they could get away with a smaller piece. Okay. It's still saying that position is chiral. 
Hi. Make sense? At least ish. Hi. So they're mostly simple. Add your hydrogen, add the nucleophile, and then you run. Hi. You do just have to kind of watch out for some of those stereochemical traps. Okay. The other nucleophile, instead of it being halogens, we could use oxygen as a nucleophile. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> well, so that gave all that away. Okay. We can use both oxygen and nitrogen as potential nucleophiles. Okay. The problem with both of those is that if I went in and drew in oxygen as a nucleophile, we would get OH minus, yes? Would that react with an alkene? So I'm, I'm hearing some kind of instinctive no's. Good. Why? The oxygen is negative. Right? In and of itself, that's not a big deal. But you also added, how does the alkene react? With electrons. Meaning, the alkene is acting as a nucleophile, an electron donor. What's the hydroxide acting as? A nucleophile. What's going to happen? Nothing. nothing. There's nothing to cause a reaction to happen. Okay? This is why when we think about alkenes, we need to remember their reactivity. Why are they reacting? Okay? This is why I told you to memorize the acid, base, nucleophile, electrophile definition. Because if you can classify the structure you're working with according to that category, you can then whittle away some of the chemistries that are potentially possible for it. Okay? That vastly simplifies a question. Okay? So how can I get oxygen to act as a nucleophile? This would need to be electrophilic, right? How do I make the alkene electrophilic? What charge does the alkene need to be to be electrophilic? need to be positive. What could I add to the structure to get those electrons not in that bond? We literally just did this. As a hint, it's at the top of the slide where it says I want to add an acid. Instead of having this react immediately as a nucleophile, okay, I'm going to react it with H+. Plus. Okay, what happens? Now the electrons come out, react with that to form a very ugly looking cyclohexene or carbocation thing. Now we have the carbocation. Now the negative can come in and react, yes? Okay, what is H+. Plus? Strong acid. What is OH minus? Strong base. strong base. Can I add a strong acid and a strong base to the exact same reaction? No. no. Okay. Which is the most important? The acid is the most important because that's the slow step in our addition reaction. We have to get to that intermediate. Okay. So the acid is my critical piece. I need to kill the nucleophile. How would I kill the nucleophile? Add an H. Make it water. So now what happens? I still have those electrons. Those electrons can now react, but I'll now have to end the reaction with a mild acid-base workup to remove that last hydrogen to get me the alcohol. Yeah? Okay, kind of cool. We could theoretically attempt it with nitrogen. Nitrogen becomes a bit of a problem with these and we can't really pull those off. Okay, and we'll look at why nitrogen becomes a problem in just a second. Uh, actually, no, we'll do it right now. Why would nitrogen become a bit of a problem? The amine can be an acid? If NH3 acts as an acid, what does it form? NH2 minus. What can you tell me about NH2 minus? Okay. Strong base. You're telling me over here that this wasn't, or now you're like, well, wasn't hydroxide a strong base? What is the difference in base strength between hydroxide and NH2? 
give you an idea. pK of water is? Okay, 15.7, 16. pK of the amine? 35. 10 to the 20 difference in strength of acid-base characteristics. The amide is a massively stronger base. Okay, in second semester, we come up with a new term for a strong base. It's no longer a strong base, it becomes stupidly strong base. An amide is a stupidly strong base. Okay? It is so stupidly strong that does NH3 act as an acid? No, it only acts as a base. Okay? If it acts as a base, what's going to happen in the presence of sulfuric acid? It's going to neutralize to become NH4+. Plus. What's the problem with NH4+. Plus? What did I want the nitrogen to act as? A nucleophile. And what does a nucleophile need? Electrons. electrons. Does NH4 plus have electrons? No. no. And in fact, what happens? Nothing. The acid reacts with the amine, kills the reaction right out of the gate. Can't get anything to actually happen. The nitrogen won't react with the alkenes. The only way to get a nit... Uh, ignore that. Okay. So when we're looking at our nucleophiles, we're talking about our halides and oxygen. Okay. Does it have to be water as a nucleophile? Does this also give me oxygen? Yes. What would the product be? Ah, uh, uh, so right there I'm gonna I'm gonna stop you. <laughs> because what I should have seen everybody do. Because I asked a question, and as soon as you see a question, what should you do? You should be drawing. You should be writing out what's going to happen. There's no more thinking in your head. You need to be writing it down. You commit right now. You write it down. Draw that process out. If that is an alcohol, what happens? What would I expect for a product? You'd get that. So what happens? Your alkene reacts with the acid. You form a carbocation. Now what happens? What do we need to stabilize a positive? Electrons. Electrons from? From the oxygen. What happens? I'd have a positive oxygen. Good. Do I want a positive oxygen? What does it do? Steals the electrons from hydrogen. And what do I get? I get an ether. Cool. That's it. Same basic structure. Okay. For the reaction to run, we need the oxygen to act as a nucleophile, and we need an easily removable hydrogen like we had with water, so that we could get our final neutral structure. Are there other forms of oxygen that we could draw in there? Yeah, hell yeah, why not? Let's go ahead and throw in another one. All right, let's go ahead and make it ROR. What's our product now? What's the first thing that happens? Alkene grabs the hydrogen. We form a carbocation. Is the carbocation stable? Yeah. No. So what happens? Grabs the electrons from the oxygen. What do we get? A positively charged oxygen. Does the oxygen want to be positively charged? No. Where can it steal electrons from? Not much of foreshadowing there. going to steal it from the original structure. The electrons go right back to the oxygen. Okay. Some of this is going to depend what those R groups are, but typically when we're looking at 
those as R groups, those are going to be CH3s. Okay? Why would the oxygen not steal electrons from a CH3 or a CH2? Why is that a bad maneuver? It would be unstable. It would be what unstable? I already had a carbocation. Elaborate. It would be a, in this case, a zero-area carbocation. Am I allowed to form a zero-area carbocation? Nope. So it can't pull from those. So all that ends up happening is we end up reversing the reaction, going back to the carbocation. Where does that carbocation get electrons from then? From the hydrogen that was just put on. And we reverse all the way back to the beginning. And what do we see? Nothing, Nothing happened. Right? So when we're looking for these reagents, we're looking for positives and negatives, balancing out those positives and negatives, and drawing those intermediates and evaluating. Would I be making something more stable? If I do, yes, keep going. If you don't, stop and go backwards. Okay. What we're encountering in this case is we're going to end up running into some dead ends. I'm just trying to set you up so that you can see those dead ends. Make sense? When are we done? Oh, okay. That makes a lot more sense. Okay. So when we look at the acid catalyzed mechanism with oxygen, okay, same general process. The oxygen does not have to come from water. It can come from an alcohol. Okay. This is where students tend to freak out because they go, oh, it's another reagent sequence to memorize. Because we go with water and H+. And they go, oh, God, I have to memorize another one because I have to do an alcohol and water. These two reactions are freaking identical. Okay. They may not look identical because what you're doing is focusing on what makes them different. Focus on what makes them the same. Look at how the electrons move between them. It's not memorizing more things. It's actually memorizing less. Okay. What is our constraint? Could I have gone through and said this was ROR? Would that have worked? We just tested that one. What happened with that one? It didn't work. It didn't work. So what is the constraint on my oxygen source? The oxygen must be connected to It must be connected to at least one hydrogen. As long as I've got that hydrogen, oxygen can steal electrons away from the hydrogen, eject the hydrogen. Catalyst, I have to reform it. Okay. As long as it has that extra hydrogen that I can ditch back out, I'm golden and I can run the reaction. Okay. Kind of make sense? Okay. Is there another base that we could have used? We didn't have to have an alkene. We could have had. An alkyne, a triple bond. That has two pi bonds. Why does that now become interesting? With two pi bonds, how many addition reactions could you do? Two. You could potentially do two. So if I add HBr, oh. Shut up. <laughs> That's a jerk. I'm not crying. <laughs> no, I think I might actually cry. I think an eyelash is folded into my eyeball. Um, if we look at our hydrogen, we're going to still do the acid base reaction. Okay, it's still the same call. The hydrogen reacts out. We have our double bond. We're going to form the carbocation in the more stable position. Is that carbocation particularly stable? Yeah. Why are you saying it's stable? Resonance. Resonance. No. no. Perpendicular orbitals. The carbocation and the pi system are in perpendicular planes. They don't touch each other. If that was stable... Would this have reacted in a substitution reaction, the blue structure? Yeah, it would have, right? In an SN1, that would have formed, does it? No, it does not. Why? Because that carbocation? Not stable. Why is it not stable? It's not secondary. What is the hybridization of that carbon? 
SP, what can you tell me about an SP carbon? It is the most electronegative carbon that I can get. If it's the most electronegative, is it going to stabilize a positive charge? No, that carbocation is insanely unstable. Okay, That is not a happy carbocation. If I can get it to form, then what happens? Then bromide can come in and react. We would then form a nice kind of stable haloalkene. We still have a pi bond, so now what can happen? Another reaction. Can pick up another H+. Plus. Is this carbocation now stable? A little bit more. Nice, safe answer. Argue it's actually a lot more stable. Why? So one big answer, there's literally resonance from the bromine that can stabilize that carbocation. Okay? Lots of electron density around there. If you don't like the resonance, you don't have to use the resonance argument. This is almost uh, what <coughs> tertiary plus okay? or secondary plus because it's two carbons and a bromine. Okay? So that carbocation is stable. So that step of the reaction is now relatively fast. Another bromide can come in, attack, and I can do the double addition. Okay? But all of this hinges on this very first step. I have to be able to make that first carbocation. That carbocation is not easy to make, so what could I do? Add heat. Add heat. Cook the crap out of it. Okay? If you heat it up enough, what is that going to do to the pi bond? weaken it enough that it can react with the hydrogen so that I can form this. Okay? So that's one way. Break the bond by any means necessary. I'm just going to vibrate the crap out of it. What else could you do? What am I representing? I was just representing an acid. I might have just done you know that. Like HBr. What am I representing? Strong. What kind of strong acid? Isn't HBr a strong acid? I can throw in a stupidly strong acid. So I can throw in a stronger acid to force the reaction to happen. So typically when we're talking about the alkynes reacting, we usually have to throw in a stronger acid to help catalyze this. They're usually done with higher heat because that first intermediate is not a stable structure. Okay. Can it still happen? Yes, absolutely. They are potentially useful because we've got those bromines. We now have two substitution positions possible to us. Okay? So they can be used. Okay? So yeah, there's our unstable car carbocation. Okay? So to overcome this, I can throw in a lot of HBr. I can throw in more time, I can throw in more heat. All of these things can be used to help kind of overcome that obstacle, okay? The one that I actually want to get to would be this guy, okay? We saw acids with hyd or halogen nucleophiles. We saw acids with oxygen nucleophiles. What would you expect the product to be? What do you think? How does the pi bond respond? Not particularly stable. Well, I got a strong acid. I help pushing this. Then what could I do? I have the OH, so I could get. Through a couple of steps, right? Yeah. Here? Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Still got a strong acid. Here. I still got a strong acid, so we go through a couple more steps. And we can go here. Uh, I don't like that one. Wouldn't that be exactly what the halogen just did? And wasn't the 
halogen reaction that we just ran the same for alcohols or water and acids with alkenes? Why are you saying that's wrong? It is wrong. You ready for the answer? There's your answer. We'll pick up there on 